welcome to the Abbey. My name is Andy. Uh, I have not taught this class in, in a while. Uh, so it's good to be back. Everybody is very uh, supportive and appreciative. Uh, whoever gave me the mixtape, thank you. I'll listen to this later. Um, so I'll give a round of applause for a DJ, DJ Mushu. So Mushu is the endless DJ in Pittsburgh. So why don't you show what you can do? Let her in. All right. So, do you want me to stop or? Yeah, stop. Yeah, yeah, we're going to teach class. All right. Uh, so, Mushu is the, uh, the hottest unsigned artist in Pittsburgh. So, uh, we're really appreciative of him being here. How are things, man? I mean, I'm good. I'm just here to drop some, drop some dang beats, but I'm surprised he's still in Pittsburgh. Uh, yes. So, yes, it is true. I did have a rough summer. Uh, the, all right, so I haven't talked in a while. Uh, my ex-wife, <laughs> year ago, still healing up. That's why I have to wear a mask. Uh, but I'm back. I'm here to do data So thank you. Again, Mushu, thank you for being here. Um, okay, so let's do this. All right, so before we get started, I first want to talk about... This uh, works. Let's see. Sorry. Uh, all right, so uh, before we get started, I want to first want to thank Snowflake uh, for sponsoring the class. They're paying for extra TAs and course development uh, throughout the entire semester. Um, if you've never heard of Snowflake before, they are a distributed cloud native OLAP vectorized data warehouse. And if everything I said there doesn't make sense, that's okay, because that's what the, you'll learn all these things uh, throughout the semester. Nice move. All right, um, and so they will be giving a guest lecture at the end of the semester. Uh, they will also have uh, internships available for senior students, and I'll post all this on Piazza, how to apply and help them out. And then they're coming to campus for the, the, the career fair, I think in two weeks. Um, so we can, we can make arrangements for students in this class to go talk to them if you would like. The other thing I want to bring up too about the, about the course uh, throughout the entire semester is that you need to understand where I'm coming from as I teach databases. Right? And the most important thing you have to understand is I really only care about two things in my entire life. All right. The first one is my wife and my biological daughter. And the second one is databases. So I really don't have any other hobbies. It is just pathologically focused on databases. And so if you ask me any question about database, I might be able to answer it. Some questions will be appropriate for the class, some, some we do after class. Uh, but I'm happy any time to talk about databases. Okay. So that's, that's the most important thing about the entire semester. All right, so for this lecture today, uh, I'm going to focus quickly on course logistics. Everything is available on, on the syllabus website. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time going over all the details of things, but we can, we can cover these later. I want to focus more about uh, jumping right into the course material. But the, the main thing I want to bring up first is about the wait list. Uh, so if you probably have noticed, the wait list is massive this semester. I think we, we got to like 450. We're like in third or fourth place in terms of like the longest wait list in the university. It's some ML class in English, and then, and then, then I think us. Um, so I don't control the wait list. Uh, we can only take 120 students. Uh, the, the wait list got so large that the SCS admins took over it, and I can't control who's actually admitted anymore. Um, so the admin will put people off the wait list and enroll them as new spots come available. Just to be honest, though, at this point, if you're not enrolled in the class, you're very unlikely to get, get in. Again, I apologize. There's nothing I can do. The good news is that Cuddy C, Charlie in the back, will be teaching... Uh, the data class in the spring semester. Uh, so if you can't get in this semester, you have an opportunity to take it in the spring. Okay? All right, cool. The other thing I want to talk about is the lecture rules. So I get very excited when I talk about databases, and I end up start, start talking really fast. So if I'm speaking too fast, please interrupt me and tell me to slow down and repeat myself. Or if you have a question as we're, as we're going along about the material, please stop me and say, this doesn't make sense. Can you repeat it? And we can cl clarify certain things. Okay? Um, I don't want you guys to interrupt me. Uh, if you have like questions like, can you go to the bathroom? Yes, we're all adults. You can do that. And also, we're not going to talk about blockchain this entire semester. Are you kidding me? What? <laughs> we're not talking about blockchain. Why would I talk about blockchain? Because it's pretty relevant, I think, today. Uh, we'll cover that later. No, we're, no blockchain questions, okay? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, and the other thing I do is I don't want you to ask. What, I, what I'm not going to allow you to do is at the end of the, end of the lecture, Everybody run down to the podium and ask me the same questions about like slide four, slide five. So I want you to interrupt me uh, as we go along. Because if you have questions while we're talking, other people probably have similar questions. 
So please like stop me and, and we can we can go over this. Okay. So I'm not gonna answer any questions about collection material immediately after the class. Okay? All right, so this class is entirely about the design and implementation of database management systems. In my opinion, that's the most important class of software that exists in the world today. Um, and that's why there's an entire class uh, specifically about it. Um, so this course would not be how to use a database or design an application to use a database. That is taught in Heinz College. Uh, you'll get exposure to SQL in the first uh, assignment for the first homework. But beyond that, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about how we do certain things at the application level, right? This is really about how to build the system on the inside to be able to execute queries and store data, okay? All right, all the projects will be on the system we've been working on at that party email called Bust Up. Uh, so this is an academic system that we've written in C++, uh, and all the projects will be entire entire this one repository. So this is why we encourage you to get started with Project Zero as soon as possible. Uh, to set up your dev environment, make sure you understand C++ enough in order to get through the class, because um, the projects are going to be cumulative, meaning you have the the you know the second project will be built on what you built in the first one, or use what you built in the first one. So if you screw up the first project, you're going to have trouble throughout the semester. So I would encourage you to start the projects as soon as possible. Okay. And then for late days, we're going to allow you a total of four late days throughout the entire semester. Obviously, if there's extenuating circumstances or you're sick. You know, send me an email, don't email the TAs, and we can talk through it. Uh, but everyone will be allowed for late days for the, throughout the projects. Okay? All right, so all this material is on the course website. All the discussion and announcements about the course will be on, on Piazza. All your homeworks and projects you'll submit through Gradescope. And then the final grades will be posted on Canvas. Canvas has a bunch of other features like discussion boards and, and, and assignments and, and schedules. Ignore all that. Use the course website and then use Piazza. Okay? All right, for, for people that are watching this video now later on that aren't enrolled in this class at CMU, uh, if you want to take all the assignments, everything will be available in Gradescope. Uh, so use that Gradescope code. Uh, there, we have GitHub discussions. And there's a Discord channel for people outside of CMU you can use. If you're a CMU student, don't go there. Don't use these things. Go to Piazza because the TAs will be there to help you, right? The, T, the TAs are going to be monitoring these things. So in exchange for people that are watching this, for us giving all our, our material away, putting it public on the on the internet, I'm asking for someone here to, to finish my Wikipedia article. Um, I didn't write it. Somebody wrote it uh, a year ago, uh, and they put this line in here that I was born in the streets of Baltimore. So <laughs> they got this from some interview I did with a few, few years ago. Uh, so then somebody put that in there, and then they flagged it saying it wasn't professional. So if someone wants to come and fix this, uh, my birthday is May 20th, 1981. They, they also flagged that one. But anyway, so not you guys here, people outside of CMU, please fix this. All right, so uh, most important for you, for you guys here, uh, I don't have to say this, but I have to, well, I shouldn't have to say this, but I'm going to say it, is that do not plagiarize on your homework, do not plagiarize on your projects. Uh, these are not group assignments. Uh, you can discuss the code to get with each other, discuss high-level ideas, but you should not be sharing code with each other. Uh, Grayscope has now a built-in plagiarism detector. We will use it. Furthermore, because all the projects uh, will be public, there's people, random people on the internet that also implement these things on GitHub. So what all we do is do a keyword search to find 445 or bus tub. We download all that, make a fake student, put that in grade scope, and then see whether you're copying stuff from out on the internet. So please don't copy anything. Uh, please don't copy any source code. Please, please don't copy from each other. Um, if you have any questions like, hey, you know, there's this clock replacement algorithm I saw in Boost or STL. Can I use that as inspiration for my work? If you're not sure, please email me because I'd rather talk about it and figure things out now rather than you do something stupid and then I gotta go to Warner Hall and light you up, okay? So there's a, the CMU policy of academic integrity. So by having this now uh, in, in, in the, memorialized in the video, if you do screw up and you do plagiarize, I just show Warner Hall this video where you saw this, uh, whether or not you pay attention or not, but I said it in the class, and then this is proof that uh, you did something you shouldn't have done, okay? All right, uh, beyond this class, if you're interested in databases as much as I am, we're also having a seminar series uh, starting on the September 12th, where we invite people outside of CMU to come talk about their database systems. It's a combination of researchers with mostly people from industry. Uh, so everything will be on Zoom, and then we'll, be, we'll publish on YouTube afterwards. Uh, and so this is the lineup we're having this semester. And again, this is like, this is optional, this is beyond what we're discussing in the class. But if you want to learn more about how real systems are actually implemented based on the techniques and methods and 
and fundamentals that we're talking about this semester, this will be an opportunity to, to, to learn more there. So Schnebling, of course, is, is coming to give a talk. Um, but there's, a, this is sort of, there's no theme. This is a bunch of random systems that I find interesting. Like Gaia is a, a, a database built for autonomous robots. So I find, I find that kind of cool. Um, with Splinter DB, that's actually being written by somebody here at Tepper, uh, who's a, he, he already has a PhD, he's at VMware, and he's building this database system. So again, this stuff is super interesting, at least to me, and I encourage you to come check it out. Okay? So any questions about course logistics before we get into the material? All right, let's fire away. All right, databases, the, uh, the second most important thing in my life. Um, so let's play a game here. See, can anybody name a database for me? He says MySQL. Anybody else? Yes, the back. MongoDB. MongoDB. Postgres. Postgres. Redis. Redis. Neo4j. 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 Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> anybody else? SQLite. SQLite. Okay, so this would be sort of a bit pedantic here, but everything they did, they all just named, those are database systems, right? That's the software that's going to manage what a database is. So a database, as, as so I'll define it, is a going to be a collection of data that's somehow interrelated together that's meant to model some aspect of the real world. Like if I have a, a university, they have a registered database, keeps track of all the students, what class they're enrolled in, right? The database is the data that represents the students of the courses that they take. The database system is the software that's going to manage that, that database. I think CM uses, uses Oracle. Um, we're actually switching to Snowflake as well, but it's, but when you register for classes, I'm pretty sure it goes through Oracle. Um, and so databases are gonna be the core component that you're gonna counter throughout your entire career, whether or not you're staying in computer science, whether or not you're actually a developer, no matter where you go in the world, at the end of the day, there's gonna be some kind of database. It could just be an Excel spreadsheet, uh, or it could be something that's you know, multiple petabytes and really, really big. But this could be the most important thing, again, I, I think you're gonna have to encounter in your career, and what this course is going to teach you is to understand what the so database system software is doing when you store data, or when you write queries and run queries on it, right? So that's what we're really trying to, trying to understand here. So um, to give a quick, 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 quick example and walk through uh, what a database looks like um, and then sort of build a straw man system we could use to store, store it and do stuff with it. And then that'll segue into why sort of this approach is a bad idea and why we want to talk about all the things we're going to talk about uh, this semester. So let's say we want to create a simple database that's going to model a digital music store. So iTunes, Spotify, Bandcamp, whatever you want to use. And we have a really simple uh, model where we just have a, a, a table or a file that represents artists, and then a collection of data that represents the albums that they produce. So the only thing we really need to store in this really simple database is just going to be some information about the artists and information about the albums. So a really simple system we could build for this would just be to store the artist and album's information in two separate files uh, as comma separated values, so CS CSVs. So artist.csv and albums.csv. And every single line in that file is going to represent some, you know, some entity in, our, in, in this collection of data. So we'd have one line for every artist and one line uh, for every album. So now in our application code, every single time we want to do a query and look something up, we just have to open the file, parse it line by line, and try to find the, the data that we're looking for. Right? So we can have a really simple example like this. Right? Again, the artist has name, year, country, uh, and then album is just name, artist, and year. And so in our application code, if we now wanted to find uh, answer questions like, what was the year that, that Jizzo went solo, or his solo album came out, uh, we would just write some simple Python code like this that would just go line by line, parse the CSV, look to see whether the first field equals Jizza. If yes, then print out the year after casting it to an integer, right? This is technically, this, you know, this is the database. This is not really a database system, but this is a way to interact with the database. Is this a good idea or a bad idea? Bad. bad. Oh, I already said it was going to be bad, so why? Who said bad? What's that? This querying is linear time. We're not even there yet in terms of performance, but yes, he's absolutely right. It's linear time, meaning like, what if Jizza is the last line and I got to scan through the whole thing to find it, right? So my simple example, I have three rows, but again, always think in larger scales. What if I have a billion rows or a hundred billion rows? 
but I want to scan through every single line trying to find what I'm looking for. Yes. She said, what if there's multiple Jizza albums? So we're trying to find, uh, we're looking at the artist tables. We're only looking look at artists. But you're getting into them. What if there's multiple Jizzas? How do we know we have the right Jizza? What if Jizza is lowercase? What if Jizza is lowercase? Yes, that's another issue. Yes. In the back. You have to go out to disk every time you want to do a query like this. He says, you have to go to disk every single time. You have, you have to go out to disk every single time you, you want to do a query like this. Not necessarily, but at large scale, yes. Right. So his statement is, uh, if the file is too large to store in memory, then at some point you have you are going to have to go to disk. Uh, that's a better way of saying what he said. Yes, that's another issue. But that's how do you say this? That's getting to performance things, which are important, which we will cover. I'm just more concerned about like some basic, uh, like is this safe or the right thing to do? Yes. Well, I was going to say that. You know, the columns aren't perfectly formed. You have to just index it, which would make less for this issue. Right. So she says that the columns aren't labeled. It's just, it doesn't have the CFDs. So if I, my application code here, I literally hard coded zero. Like I want the zero offset to be array. Right. So if, you know, it's the, the metadata about what the data actually looks like is embedded in the application code. One more, yes. We have to parse text, which is a really inefficient representation of the data. Right. So he has to, you have to parse every single line every single time you run this query, which is very inefficient. Yes. All right. Last one. Yes. In addition to being inefficient, parsing in your code might be extremely unsafe depending on the format of the data. It often might be better if the, if the management system already had some kind of format, so no parsing is required, so you couldn't inject evil uh, data. So his data is that. Uh, Parsing a CSV could be dangerous because someone puts like a malformed character, uh, and then somehow you can do code injection uh, by a crappy, like having do something malicious in here. Yes, I haven't thought that. That's a new one. I've thought about that. Uh, I don't know whether the CSV libraries have problems like that. Well, the problems. Well, independent. If you're just saying parse, who knows how to parse? Yeah, sure. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I think we hit, we all we all hit the uh, the sort of main points, but I'm going to go through a couple others here, right? So, uh, so related to what she said before about what if there's multiple JISs, uh, so how do we ensure that the, the, if JISA has multiple albums and in our albums table, we're just storing the name JISA, how do we know it's the right JISA, right? Or what if it's one's lowercase and one's uppercase? How do we make sure all that's consistent? Um, what happens if someone goes and overwrites the year in our file with a, a random string, like an email address? Like if these are just files on disk, I can open up BI and write whatever I want to it. And now my application code is going to expect an integer and, and it's going to see an email address and it's going to freak out. And then more importantly, what happens in the case where I have multiple albums, or sorry, multiple artists in my album, right? The way I sort of designed my database right here, I can't easily do that, right? Because it assumes sort of one artist, it's one album has one artist. And then what happens now if I delete the artist how do I make sure I also delete all the albums, right? These are two separate files. The file system doesn't know anything that they're, that they're connected, how they're connected. So if I, if I delete Jizza, how do I make sure I delete all his, his albums? I have to go write application code to go do that. All right, so now in terms of implementation, how do you find a particular file or a particular record? We talked about doing linear scan, right? This example here, again, it's just looking line by line, trying to find what you're looking for. And when you're done, you, you, you bounce out. But now what happens if I have a application that wants to use the same database? Right now, say this is written in Python code, but I have a new application. I want to use the same files, but I'm going to write in Rust. Now in my, in my Rust code, I got to write the, the basically the same logic to how to parse, parse the file and jump to what offset to find the data that I'm looking for. That sucks. Then what if I have two threads at the same time, but also want to write to the file concurrently? Now I can do file system blocking to take care of that. But again, if I have a billion records, in my file, do I want to take a lock on that, 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 that entire file just to update one thing? Right? It would both be more efficient if I could have more fine grained locking. And the last one that nobody actually uh, brought up is durability. So, how to make sure that the data is safe if there's, if there's a problem occurs, if there's a crash or something. Right? So, if I'm updating a record uh, in this file and then my program crashes, what should happen? Should I come back and see the original version? Should I see the completed version, or should I see a partial version? What should you know? What what do I expect to see, uh, and what would be correct in terms of uh, 
with the database semantics. And the one that nobody brought up, uh, comes up sometimes in different years, is, you know, what if I, uh, this database is too big to store on a single machine, and now I want to either replicate it for high availability, or I'm going to split across multiple databases or multiple, multiple machines, so I can run things in more parallel. How do I make sure all these things are consistent? Right? So we've covered a lot of things uh, you know, pretty quickly about why this, my, my toy example here is problematic. Uh, and this is essentially the motivation of why you want to use a database management system. Right? So a state management system is going to be a, a piece of software that's going to expose an API to your application code that allows you to store and analyze and manipulate uh, data in a database. Right? The reason why we don't want to have to manage this, this the, sort of the big reason why we don't want to manage this, this database in our application code is that it's a huge waste of time, right? If you're going off to like a startup and you're trying to build a new web app or a new, new software as a service, do you really want to be spending your time making sure your files are all, the data in your files is stored safely and correctly, right? You, you know, no one's going to care that, oh, if you crash, uh, if your program crashes, you come back, all your data is safe. Like that's not a, that's not a, a how do you say that's not a distinguishing feature to sell your product versus another product. That, that's sort of assumed. It's table stakes. Assume that you're not going to lose data. So why are you going to spend time in your application writing, you know, reinventing the wheel to make sure your files are safe? We just rely on a data management system to do it for you. Right? Data management systems are, are, are widely tested and deployed. Uh, you know, they're going to do a much better job doing all the things that we talked about here than you, you know, some random JavaScript programmer banging this out for the first time. Right? So you always want to be using a, almost always want to be using a data management system. We can talk about the caveats why I don't think you want to. Um, and so a general purpose data management system is going to allow you to uh, define what the database looks like, create the database, put data in it, query it, update it, do all the administration that you want to do uh, programmatically uh, according to some data data model. And so a data model is going to be the the data model is going to be a way we define the, or a high level of abstraction for the concepts that we're going to be storing in, in our database, right? So relational model is the key one that we'll talk about in the next slide, but it's going to be a way to say how you define what your data looks like, the shape of it, right? Not necessarily maybe what the attributes are, like is it integers, is, is it floating point numbers, but really like what's the, what's the, what does the core entity in this database look like? And the schema is going to be the way we, we, we tell the computer or tell the database system what we want this database to look like according to this, this data model. So uh, these are a list of data models right here. Uh, the, the top one here, relational one, this is what most database systems, when you think about, pretty much all the ones that we listed here, for, we already listed in the beginning, except for Neo4j and MongoDB, these be relational databases, right? Uh, this is what this course will be about, because again, in my opinion, this is the most important one. There's another category of, of systems that use these two different data models. You might have heard the term NoSQL. Uh, typically, when people say NoSQL, they typically mean the document or object model, uh, but it kind of loosely covers all these things. As you can imagine, the term NoSQL is not a scientific term, so this is not like, it's, it's a loose categorization. You can also have a data model that defines the data based on arrays, matrices, or vectors. This is typically used in machine learning and typically used also in like, like satellite imagery or medical Im imagery. Um, and there's a bunch of these guys here at the bottom that are uh, what I'll call like old man, old person uh, data models. Uh, these go back to like some of them, like the 1960s, early 1970s. These are all obsolete uh, and rare. If you go out in the real world and you're working at a company that has these things, I advise you not to work there. Um, <laughs> but when I say that, like, a lot of the banks still use IMS, which is uh, IBM built in the 1960s. So, I mean, these things still exist. It's just no startup is saying, I want to use a hierarchical data model or I want to use IMS, right? Uh, most, most of the time, you'll be using a, a relational data model. All right, so uh, for this class, we're going to focus entirely on uh, the relational data model, but I'll briefly talk about the Docker data model and the key values that will come up uh, throughout the semester. So, okay. with blockchain, being in Web three, which I think is pretty relevant. Why is that not here? <laughs> Your question is. I walked on it for the spots, and I'm not even having on the data most places. Your question is why isn't blockchain listed here? Yes. Uh, well, blockchain is not a data model, right? Blockchain is a is an implementation, right? So you could have like a data model on top of it, but it's it's 
It's not. It's not debatable. In my opinion, though, I think it should be up. Well, hold on. Oh, like, you know, it's like, like, I'm not. You know, it's people are using it for web three. It's literally the future. Blockchain is archaic. Blockchain is the system you would have. Like, it's based on a distributed ledger. You store things in it. The mechanism is the distributed ledger, but like something has to interpret what the bytes are you're storing in the blockchain, right? Blockchain is better than this. <laughs> I, no. And I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm. I don't think you know what you're talking about. This class, I thought that literally it was irrelevant. It's not archaic. No, we're not. We're not the and blockchain is not and all that. Talking about, and you know, sorry to waste all your guys' time, but this is crazy. And I think you need to get with it. Man. Okay. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> you know who that is? Wait, hold on. You know who that is? No. Like some sabotage. All right. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. Blocking right, too. So, so. <laughs> Um, <laughs> blockchain is basically a distributed ledger, right? There is, there are blockchain databases. Sometimes you can store documents in them. Sometimes you can store relational databases in them. Sometimes the key value stores. Uh, but it's sort of a, 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 an implementation of, of the system itself. You still need something on top of it to, to like, as I said, said to my guy, like interpret the bytes. Uh, so you can have a relational blockchain database. You can have a key value store blockchain database. Uh, in my opinion, uh, my opinion, the only good use for the blockchain uh, is Bitcoin. Everything else is all a scam and a waste of time. We can talk about it later on, but like there is no, I can't think of any reason why you would need a Byzantine fault tolerant distributed ledger for most applications. Okay? So we'll leave it at that. We can cover this later. <laughs> all right, so let's go back to the 1960s uh, and talk about some of the early databases that were out there. So the, the, I mean, Back in the 1960s, like, you know, computers were brand new, obviously very big, very expensive, very slow. Uh, but then people realized that they didn't want to write the application the way I showed before, where like you, it's, hand, it's hard coded in the application, how to interpret data and files. They started building these general purpose systems. So the early ones are, the earliest one is IDS. Uh, it's actually built, I think by GE, uh, or I don't know. Um, and the IMS was built by IBM to manage the Apollo moon mission, like to manage all the parts to build the, the rockets. And these things are based on something called Codasil. If you've never heard of it, that's fine. If you ever heard of COBOL, it's crap from, from that, right? And so back in the day, like the way these systems work, there was sort of a tight coupling between what the database looked like logically and the physical implementation of it or the physical manifestation of it on, on, on disk, right? So what I mean by this is in, in the case of like IMS in the early versions, you had to say ahead of time, did you want to store a collection of data, they weren't tables, so you think of it like a table. Do you want to store this as a, as a hash table? Or do you want to store this as a tree structure? And based on what choice you made, then that exposed a different API to you to do tree stuff versus hash stuff, right? So now the problem is if you change your mind later on, said, well, I, I actually want to do range scan, so I don't want to use a hash table, I want to use a tree. Not only did you have to dump the data back out and load it back in as a different data structure, then you had to go change all your application code to now re reflect the change of the API, right? So this was a huge problem, but of course, back then, computers were super expensive. Humans were, were, were relatively cheap. So you just kind of threw more humans programmers at the, you know, at the problem. So there's this guy who was a mathematician who just finished his PhD at University of Pennsylvania. And he started working at IBM Research in, in New York. And he saw all these like IBM database developers you know, repeating a reinventing wheel over and over again by having to, to uh, re-implement their database code every single time there was, you know, there was a change. Like if they added a new column in the, in the table, again, they weren't tables, but I added a new column, a new attribute, I had to go make major changes to my application code. So you saw all these people doing the same thing, making the same changes over and over again, and not to be cliche, but he, he realized that there was a better way of doing this. So he proposed the relational model in 1969 as a sort of mathematical abstraction to how you would represent a database and interact with the database. Um, so the first paper came out of the tech report, in 1969, um, but then the, the follow-up work, the, the one that everybody cites is this one from this article here uh, in, in the communications of the ACM in 1970. And so this paper was, was 
the things that he talked about in this seem obvious to us now, but you got to understand back then, this is very, very radical, right? In the same way, like the C compiler from the Unix guys, that was a radical idea. They could take high level language and compile it down into machine code, and that'd be better than humans writing assembly. Like, th these are very um, controversial ideas at the time. Of course, now, you know, the relational model persevered. You've never heard of Codasil, you've never heard of IMS, or definitely never heard of IDS. So all the ideas that, that or all this, the people were like, hey, this, this is stupid, our way is better, they all lost in TED Pod 1. Right? So the relational model defines an abstraction layer for how we want to represent, represent relations to avoid this maintenance overhead uh, of the, the TED Pod was seeing back in the day. And there's sort of three key tenets of this. The first is that we're going to store the database in simple data structures, i.e. relations. And I'll, I'll explain what a relation is in a second. And then the, the next key idea is that the physical storage of the, of the database is left up to the implementation. So no longer do you have to define, I want to store my data as a tree, I want to store my data as a hash table, or a column store, or a row store. Uh, you just say, here's my relation, here's my attributes, and the database system can try to make the best decision of how it actually wants to store it. And again, this, this was radical back in the day. And then the other key idea is that instead of writing sort of procedural code, either COBOL, Fortran, or, or C code, to make direct calls to the, the database API, instead you're going to use a high level language to tell the database system what you want it to do for you, and then the database system will figure out the best way to do that. Now, you know, this is a, it's a relational model purist. You would say these are the key things. We'll see this if we got the semester. These things get violated. The, the, the relational model is, you know, it has as easy to find, and nobody actually follows this exactly. Uh, and some of the NoSQL systems borrow ideas from relational, relational databases. So relational databases borrow ideas from the NoSQL guys. So this is not like set in stone, but at a high level, these, these are the key, key things. So Ted Codd won the Turing Award for this in, in 1991. Uh, and he died, I think, in, in early 2000s. The other guy that invented the codicil, he won the Turing Award in 72, because, you know, before they knew that he was wrong. Uh, he's dead, too. Okay. So, relational models are going to have three parts. We're going to have the structure, so this is a definition of what the database relations and their attributes look like. Uh, we'll have the integrity constraints. We define what data is allowed to be stored uh, in the database. And then we'll have a uh, manipulation API that allows us to read data and write data and, and, and you know, produce run queries and produce answers. All right, so let's use a really simple example. Let's go back to our, our Spotify uh, application. Uh, so we're going to have a, the definition of a relation is going to be, it's an unordered set that's going to obtain relationship attributes that represent entities in, in the real world, right? So the term relation, sometimes you think it means the relation between tables. It really means the relation of the attributes. And I'm going to, throughout the semester, I'm going to use the word table and relation interchangeably. Um, they, you know, it, for, all our, for our purposes, it doesn't actually matter. Like, there, there, there is not a distinction. And then within, a, within the relation, you can have a tuple, and that's going to be a manifestation of a bunch of attribute values that are collected together as, as you know, as representing an, an entity. Again, I will use the term tuple, row, record interchangeably. They, they essentially mean the same thing for our, for our purposes of this class. So in the original relational model, the values within a tuple had to be scalar or atomic, meaning a single integer, a single float, single date, string, whatever. Um, in, in modern systems, this gets violated. Right? You can have arrays of integers as an attribute. You can have, you can have JSON as, 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 a, as, a, as a value. But again, the, the original relational model said you couldn't do this. And then uh, our good friend null is going to show up again. Uh, and every attribute could, could potentially also be null for its value. You can define constraints to say you can't be null. Um, but mathematically, it's always allowed. So just the term to say if you have an n-area relation, you just mean a table with n columns. So now the way we're going to identify unique tuples is through what is called the primary key. So the primary key is going to be some set of attributes, one or more, that allow you to say, here's how to identify an exact record or exact tuple that I want. Right? So in the case of the artist table, I can, have the, I can use the name for the primary key. So I know if I want the Wu-Tang Clan, I can just find a tuple where name equals Wu-Tang. The problem, of course, with this, in this example here, is that there could be other knockoff groups Right, the other Wu Tang clans, uh, and so 
in this example here, using the name probably is not a good example of what to use for a primary key. Uh, the name here is only one Wu Tang Clan, but there's other artists that have the same names. So what we can do is we can introduce like an artificial. Uh, uh, we can use an art, introduce an artificial column, like an ID field, that will be some unique number, some unique U UUID that we assign every single record. Um, right. So in this case here, we add this thing, and this number here just represents the, the ID, and that we make that the primary key. And then you can see here the the underline and the, the name of the, the list of the columns. The underline represents the, the primary key. So a lot of database systems have ways to automatically generate these IDs. Uh, they're, they're called sequences in the SQL standard. Uh, if you're using MySQL, they call it all increment fields. And this will be a reoccurring theme throughout the entire semester. There's the SQL standard, uh, but nobody actually follows that exactly. Postgres and Oracle actually do a pretty good job. MySQL is the worst offender. Uh, so they like to do things differently for whatever reason. Uh, they're getting better at it. Um, SQLite also does this as well. Um, but anyway, so I'll, I'll try to make it clear. Like if I show SQL, say, is this, you know, is this SQL compatible with Postgres and Oracle? Or is it MySQL? So interestingly also too, some data systems will require you to have a primary key. Other systems, if you don't find a primary key, they'll make one for you. And it's going to be hidden underneath the covers, uh, like, a, like a row ID, for example. All right, so the next thing we also have are foreign keys. And this is going to allow us to uh, define how data from one relation is related to another relation, right? Like a, like a mapping. So let's say I have my artists and, and albums, and then you see I introduced the artificial ID column. Um, so I could have a, a foreign key to say, you know, what what artist applies to what album, right? But in this example here, for this mixtape here, this this sort of record twenty two, right? There's multiple artists, so I can't just put the, the artist ID in there because you know it, it won't work. Now you can put an array. We'll ignore that for now. Um, but I need a way to have this mapping back from a, you know, from one artist, sorry, from one album to, to multiple artists. So to do this, I can create like a cross-reference table where now I have foreign keys from the, like that. So I have foreign keys from the artist ID to the artist table, and from the album ID to the album table. So the foreign keys are going to allow us to define different cardinality relationships between different relations, like one to one, one to many, many, many to many, and so forth. And we're just using these IDs to figure out how to traverse and find the, the data that, that matches up that we want. Yes, in the back. Is this better than an array or does it go out? His question is, is this better than in an array? Um, so some databases will, will not let you support will not support. Uh, array integers, so there's that issue. Other systems, I, I don't know whether you can say when when you define this table. Uh, so we go back here. How is that? Just think about it. Uh, so if we go back here. If I define like this artist attribute, some systems will not let you, you. You have to declare that this is a foreign key to to this table here, and some of them won't let you do that, right? Um, the other thing, yeah. So there's that, and then. Defining it to ground up, though, would you prefer to use this structure or would you prefer a alarm or a thing? The, the correct way in the relational, relational data world is to do a separate table like this. Uh, I don't know the answer. Like, what, what, I don't know whether it would be. I don't know in what case it would be better. Uh, so. One issue would potentially be if you want to ensure that that one artist can only appear on an album exactly once, once and only once, then the array may not, would they, you may not be able to force that in the array. Where in this case here, if I make the, the primary key for this cross reference table, the artist ID and the album ID, then, I, then the data data system will prevent me from inserting the same artist ID album ID pair at the same time or twice. So that's one or two. Yeah, you, you, there's more, you have more events, yes. Yes, the back. Uh, does modern data support for like variable length attributes, or does it usually have to be a text bias? So its question is, do data systems support variable length attributes, like a, like a string? The answer is yes. We will cover that in two or three more lectures, how we actually want to store this. Yes. For simplicity, we can ignore how the bytes are actually being stored on disk. 
Yes. Like a quick follow up to the array question. So how would you in this database, like if you're not using arrays, like put multiple artists under a single album? It's so you have this cross-reference table, right? So you have you define the separate table here. And it has two attributes, artist ID and album ID. And you say the artist ID is a foreign key to the artist ID field. And then the you have the uh, the album ID is a foreign key to this. And so now, anytime I insert a record into this table, the database that will actually go look and say, oh, you're trying to insert it, you're trying to insert uh, album ID 333, does that actually exist? If no, then it, it won't let you store it. So this ensures you can't have an album, you can't have an artist ID, album ID pair that points to nothing. Other questions? Yes. Can you manually insert a row into this cross reference table? Your question is Can I manually insert a row into the cross reference table? Absolutely, yes. It's just another row. Yeah. I can write insert Zima and put right into it. Yes. Now, what we can talk about ORM this next semester or next, next class. Like, there's a class of software called object relational mappers where you write like Python code or C code, like object oriented code, and underneath the covers, they'll generate the SQL statements for you. So in that case, they will generate the insert statements that populate this thing. But again, it's just another 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 row, or sorry, it's another table. You can manipulate it like any other table. It's not it's not considered special. All right, cool, awesome. All right, so we know how to define tables. Uh, we know what to do about foreign keys, the primary keys. Let's talk about actually how do you put data into the database and actually run queries, right? So the, the DML data manipulation language is the, the way we're going to interact with the database after we define our schema. So there's two approaches. We have a procedural method, uh, writing uh, sort of high-level code that defines exactly the strategy we want the data system to take in order to uh, perform different operations. So maybe not as low level as the Python code I showed before, but still like we're defining exactly the steps we want the data system to take in a, in a specific order. For this one, we're going to, we're going to base our uh, the language to be based on set, sets of bags, which I'll explain what that is in a second. Um, and then the other approach is a sort of non-procedural declarative method, where rather than telling the data system what exactly algorithm we want to use or steps we want to take to produce some answer, we just tell what the answer we want. Uh, and it's up for the database system to figure out how to actually go ahead and do that for us, right? So the we're going to focus on the, the first method here. Uh, through relational algebra, and then for uh, next class, we'll talk about the, the declarative approach. Again, from the mathematical model of the relational model, the mathematical uh, lens of the relational model, the procedural method will be relational algebra, which we'll cover now. Uh, this declarative approach is done through relational calculus. I'm not going to teach that because 99% of you don't need it. Uh, if you're actually working on the internals of a database system, even then, you probably still don't need relational calculus. You only really need it if you're working on the optimizer, which is super hard. We'll cover that later. Um, but for, for the second one, you just think of this as SQL, right? SQL is, is, is a declarative language that you use to interact with the database. OK? All right, so let's go through relational algebra quickly. And then this will end up being the building blocks for how we write our query execution engine to, to, to run queries, to run SQL statements, right? So the Ken Ka proposed seven fundamental operators. Uh, listed here, right? These are the fundamental methods or, or ways we interact with the database to manipulate tuples in a relation. And so all of this, this algorithm can be based on uh, based on sets. Right? So unordered, uh, unordered list of data uh, when you could have repeating values. The truth is it's actually based on bags. Uh, actually, sets sets do not have repeats. Bags do. Um, so it is actually based on in a, in a real system you're going to use bags, but in relational algebra you use sets. And we'll cover this when we talk about SQL next class. So um, every operator is going to take on as, as its input one or two relations, and the output is always going to be one relation. The idea is you can daisy chain these operators together to produce some some higher level uh, to answer some higher level question you have about the query. Okay. So go through these one by one quickly. So the first is the select operator. Uh, so the idea here is that we want to take a to generate a subset of tuples. From a, from a given input relation. And we're going to find this using some first order predicate logic to specify what tuples have to, what conditions the tuples have to satisfy in order to be used in our output relation. So in the original paper, they would talk to this as the restrict uh, operator. 
but in, in the textbook, it's going to refer to it as select. And the idea here is we can have multiple predicates defined in our filtering operation to do, you know, do more complex things and get the data we actually want. So let's say we have a simple table here. Uh, R has two attributes, AID, BID. And so we could have a, a select operator that does finds all the uh, finds all the tuples where a, AID equals A2. Right? And the output of this will be, again, the, the filter results. I can combine multiple predicates together with conjunctions and disjunctions. Right? This is just Boolean logic that you've taken before. Uh, so I can say, find me all the tuples where AID equals 2 and BID greater than, than 1 or 2. And it produces the output relation. So the, 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 the analog to in SQL is just the where clause. In fact, I probably even use the term where in describing how it works. Right? So in, in your SQL statement, you put your where clause exactly this is correct, where AID equals 2 and BID is greater than 1 or 2. They're the same. The next is projection. Uh, so this one is going to be to remove certain. Sorry, question. Yes. So can we say where AID is? Let's say the AID and BID were numbers. AID is bigger for all of those. Right. Uh, so the question is, how complex are you going to make the predicates? And you, your example was like where AID is greater. Like. Then you try to say, is, can you do like where AID is greater than all other AIDs in my relation? Or like, let's say another column itself, right? Like if there are two number columns where AID is greater than BID. That, so, all right, so that was easy. So yeah, you can say where A. So this is any kind of you know, again, Boolean logic you can have here, okay. right? So you could say where AID is greater than BID, right? It doesn't matter. Is there a limit to how complex it is? This question is, is there a limit how complex to make it? It's math, right? Like, you're doing what? Yeah. And now, now, in a real system, uh, in a real system, you have these, uh, there's examples I've seen where they have, people have, uh, in the real world, single statements where the string itself, like the actual text of the string, not the results they produce, the text itself is massive, like 10 megabytes. Like, think about 10 megabyte text file. Because in the where clause, they have these giant in statements. So, like, think of like it's something in an array. So, they just think of like a giant dashboard where you click, I, you fill the things based on every single state or every single country. So, every single thing you would click on the checkbox would be another thing, something else in the same country. You can make these arbitrary complex if you want, right? In, in a real system. We'll talk about query optimizer in a second. And its job is to figure out how to reduce it down to most, you know, the, the most basic form to run most efficiently. Yes. Is the are the predicates limited by the fact that they have to be true and true or false by a single tuple, or can they be intratuple relationships like AID is the largest AID? Well, the statement is, which I thought he was asking before, is 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 the predicate do the predicates here have to be in the context of a scope of a, of a, of a single tuple? In my example here, yes. Uh, in next class, we'll see no. You can have you can have nested queries. You can have things like, um, in, in, in your example, find me the people where the AID is the greatest AID of all, of all the tables. You can do queries like that. So things like having or snowflake qualified also count as this, not just where. Uh, so you talk about having clauses. Having clauses or qualified clauses. Uh, for simplicity, no. But the answer is yes. And, <laughs> The way, the way you would have to represent the relational models, you, you would do joins. You would do like the, but the having clause is basically, the having clause is just another, it's the same thing, right? Because the having is, is to filter after you, you produce the, the result, right? So you, you would just do a select and then follow by another select. That's having. The, the sort of the comparing something in, in, in another relation, the way you would do that relational model is you would do, do the first query as produce a relation. And then do a join against uh, whatever the base table you're trying, trying to do. So the answer is yes. Uh, is the query just in relation to this particular table, or can you make an additional query? The question is, 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 is the, it's not a query. This is, this is, this is a formula, right. an equation. The question is, is, the, is this equation limited to a single relation? The answer is no. We'll see joins in a second. Question over, yes. Yeah, on the overview slide, you said there's procedural and declarative. Yes. And SQL is like, the declarative uh, 
Yes. Query language, but now we discussed the procedural languages and we have C code slide. So. All right. So yeah. So the statement is, I said that there's procedural and and then the non-procedural declared languages. But in my examples here, I'm also showing SQL. I'm trying to teach you guys the relational algebra, which is the which is the, the, the procedural approach. I'm throwing in SQL because I assume everyone knows SQL, just for you guys to map what the relational algebra to the SQL statements. That's all I'm trying to do here. Yes. Thank you for clarifying. OK, let's keep going. All right, so projection, this is the, allows us to remove certain attributes that we don't want from our relation as the, in our output. And we actually can reorder them. Uh, and we can actually manipulate them. Again, this will be in the context of a of, of the of the input relation looking at a, a single tuple at a time. Right, so if I, again, I have the same same example here. Uh, two attributes. I can have a projection operator, the lowercase pi, where I say bid is minus one hundred, and then and then a. So I I flip the order of of the of the attributes, and I'm subtracting whatever the bid value uh, by a, by a hundred. Right? And again, the analog to SQL would be just what comes after the select operator. Right? You, you do it, you manipulate it any way you want. Yes? So all column compute functions also fall under this category. Like in the string, you're padding it with space or whatever. Yes. They all fall under this category. So the statement is, or the question is, do all string functions that manipulate strings or other like built in SQL functions, where they fall under this, these projections. Yes. Everything but window and aggregations. Everything but windows and aggregations, yes, which we will cover next time. Yes. Yes, come back. Does that projection mean you can define it or sort it in any way, or is it just like that? The question is is the projection sorted or unique in any way? No, again, this is, we're entirely based on sets here. So it's, un, it's unordered. Uh, there could be duplicate. Actually, no, sets can't have duplicates. Relation algorithm doesn't have duplicates. SQL does allow duplicates. We'll cover that next class. So it's a tiny bit of sense. So unordered. All right, cool. All right, so now we start bringing in multiple uh, relations together. So the first is going to be the union operator. And this is just going to be the basic union operator from set theory, right? Uh, you're going to take the, the two relations and you're going to combine all the results and put them together. Now, in the original relational model, you have to have the two relations you're trying to unit together to have the exact same attributes, right? So in this case here, they both have AID and BID. So if I take the union of them, I just you know, put the first relation at the top, the second relation at the bottom. Again, it's unordered. It's not guaranteed to be like that. But for, for simplicity, we just say it is, right? So in SQL, there's a union all operator. And this is, again, this is the distinction between in SQL, they allow duplicates. In relational algebra, they do not. So in SQL, if you want to allow duplicates, you have to use union all. Uh, by default, with union, you get, it removes it. Sorry, it removes duplicates. Right? We can also do intersection. Again, this is just set theory. So we can take the, uh, we can generate a new relation, uh, taking two inputs where the output relation only has the tuples that appear in the first one. Uh, but not the second, right? And so in this case here, it'd be just AID uh, with A3 and 103. And then there, there's an intersect command in or keyword or operator in, in SQL. We can do difference. Uh, again, so this is taking all the tuples that appear in the first relation, but not in the second one. Yes? Sorry, Mr. Martin. Was the, is the relation one the, the all or the not all? Uh, so the question is, oh, it's back here. The question is, in the relational model, uh, the, so the relational model is union all. There's, if you remove the all, it'll, it'll remove duplicates. So that's the, that's the uh, sorry, yeah. If you remove, remove the union, it, it, if you remove the all, it, it, it gets rid of the duplicates. If you leave it union all, then you get the duplicates. What about the other ones? The other ones keep or remove duplicates? Uh, in SQL or relational algorithm? Both. Relational algorithm allows duplicates. SQL? In SQL, uh, I think they'll, they'll remove that. Yes. For something. We'll, we'll, we'll take that. We'll talk about that next class. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. For the intersection, uh, if there are duplicates of the sets and the duplicates also lie in the intersection, will, will they appear as duplicates in the final result? This question is if there's duplicates in the, uh, in the inputs, will, will, will they also appear in the outputs? Um, 
I think under relation algebra, yes. In intersect, I don't know. We we can pop up we can pop up Postgres uh, test class to see what happens. Okay. Uh, we have difference. Again, okay, another question. Oh, sorry. Yes. Her question is: Are duplicates allowed at the not allowed at the tuple level or the adjuvant level? At the tuple level, right? So I can't have like you know a a three one of three multiple times. Uh, if you want to, don't if you if you don't want to allow duplicates at the adjuvant level, you can either define them as a primary key, or we'll see next class. You can define them as a, you can have a unique constraint and say within one column, one attribute, there could be only one value of, of you know. <laughs> The relational model doesn't define unique. I don't think it defines unique constraints. Because I don't, because you can't do the relational model. Yeah. If everything in this sample, if, R, if everything in R is unique and everything in S is unique, so there's no duplicates in either of them, if you do the intersection, will everything in the intersection appear exactly twice under relational model? Not same. So if everything's unique in R and everything's unique in S, uh, <laughs> so there's no there's no matches at all. No, 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 like, 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 there, like there's no duplicates in R or S, but there are elements in R that appear in S. Do all of those elements in the intersection appear exactly once or exactly twice? I think relational model would appear once. Okay, but if one of them has duplicates, who knows? Uh, duplicates within in, in itself? Yes, if R has duplicates, but S, S has all unique things. If those multiple duplicates in R match with something in S, do the multiple things from R appear, or just the one thing from S appear? I think the one thing appears. Okay, and if both of them have duplicates in this, correct. But we 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 can look at, we can look at the textbook afterwards. I, okay. I think it, I think it's very aggressive for removing duplicates, so it probably would be removed. All right, cool. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Yes. So the question is for union intersection and uh, and, and difference, do they have to have the same attributes? Yes. That that, that is the again in uh, in SQL I think it's the same thing as well. Yes. Right, so we have the accept, accept keyword does the same thing for this. All right. All right. So now we can start talking about the, the, the set stuff. You can do it. It's not that common in your applications. But now we start talking about joins, and, and that that'll that those are very very common. So before we get the joins, we got to talk about the product operator. So the product operator, also called the Cartesian product, is basically going to generate a new output relation that has a. Um, all possible combinations of tuples on, on, the, on the first first relation and all possible tuples on the, the second relation, right? It's just sort of mashing them together and producing a giant answer like this, right? And so in this case here, we're adding uh, this this ident dot identifier in the, in the attribute name to specify where the you know, wh where the attribute came from. Is it from R? Or is it from S? Again, just think of like two, you know. A, Two nested for loops where for every single tuple in the first relation, I'm going to mash it together with every single tuple in the second relation. Produce that as the output. Right? So this seems kind of useless, right? Why would you ever actually want to do this? Uh, it does show up in testing and sort of other experimental analysis of techniques where you don't want, you have a bunch of inputs, you can try all possible combinations, throw it in your application, and see what breaks. Right? So this this does show up. But more importantly, it, it is the building block of how we're going to actually do joins. Which are which are probably the most useful operator here. So in SQL, there's a cross join uh, operator or, or command. Take you know, cross join R and S. Alternatively, if you just put R and S in there without a where clause, without a one clause, again, the, the, the database will just mash these all mash these guys together. Yes. Is that also the same as any other kind of join where the is always true? Uh, it's the same. This is the same where the, any kind of join with the relation it's always true. Uh, yeah, I think, I think if you put like where true, I think it could be the same thing. Yes. Or like left join on something. Let's call it left joins in that class. Yeah, yeah. That's a whole, that's a whole other issue. Okay, other questions?
All right, so the join operator is allows it now to do match between two poles on uh, two relations. I say two, you can't have any way joins or multi way joins. We can have multiple, more than two uh, relations. We can ignore that for now. Um, let's just say we have two. So now in our uh, in our join operator, we're going to match together the the tuples uh, where the values are you know, values are exactly the same. So again, in the original relational model, the the two relations have have the exact same schema. As you you're just looking to see, you're looking you're matching the attributes based on the name, right? So there's, there's AID in the first one, but AID in the second. You assume that there's that there's the same. Again, this is not defining with foreign keys or, or primary keys and so forth. Right? It's, it's sort of a simplistic version of this. Right, so, so you just look for, for, for every tuple, look at every AID, BID, and match it up with AID, BID value in the, in the, in the second uh, relation. And you produce an output like this, right? So now, this always comes up like, hey, isn't this just the same thing as intersection? Um, that's because this is removing the, it's different because this is removing the, the the, the duplicate attributes. So you can sort of think of this as like the example I showed before, we had all the columns from the from the, from the first relation mashed together uh, with the columns from the second relation. Um, but the original relational model doesn't specify this. In SQL, you actually can specify exactly what columns you want to get out. So we can ignore that. So in SQL, there's a command called natural join. Uh, I don't advise using this because this is going to do what I said, where they try to look to see find me all the columns that have the exact same name, and then do the join based on that. Um, it's a bad idea because like, now if you have the schemas don't match anymore, it, it, it doesn't, doesn't work. Um, you can also use the using clause where you just say, try to match, uh, match the two tables and like to do a join based on these individual columns. That's a little bit better than using the natural join because now you actually specify columns. Um, but in real applications, you typically wouldn't use this, right? Yes? Sorry, but then the intersection and the join like produce the exact same result. So, yeah, so this comes up again. Is, it, it, the difference is that, sorry, in intersection, you have to have the exact same schema. In join, you don't. Oh, because it just matches. It, it, it matches the, 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 the attributes that have the same names. Right? So if I had, if I had like an S, I had a CID, when I did the join, it would ignore it because, because the first relation didn't have CID. Oh, so it's like a more flexible. Yeah, yeah. It's like a more flexible intersection. Yes. The CID would be in the. Result. Say it again. Would the CID be in the result. The question is, would CID be in the result? Uh, actually, I don't know. Um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because if you don't need it, you just do a projection afterwards and then remove it. Okay. All right. So again, these are the basic seven operators. Uh, and for the 1970s, you can get pretty far with these. In uh, in modern systems, there, you need a lot more. A bunch of things that we're not, we're not going to talk about. Obviously, renaming columns is always useful. Uh, we need to talk about aggregations. We need to talk about sorting, which is you obviously need sorting in, in a lot of applications. Division is less rare. Uh, so there's a bunch of other stuff you, you, would, you would need. There's an extension to the relational model that have come out since since then. Yes. So since now we have uh, joins, the names of the poems matter. How do we, we specify the names of whatever what the So his question is, uh, since the name of the columns matter in the relational model, again, this, this is math. We're not actually implementing. You wouldn't actually implement a a relational algorithm engine exactly as we're describing here, right? So the the rename. The rename operator is sort of like an extension to projection. You can say, like my one example where I had BID minus 100, I could then rename that BID minus 100 back to BID. And then, then I can do the joins, whatever I want. Yes? In most of these sometimes, what does division do? That's like a little more. It's, it's, it used to be in the old class, the, the, one of the homeworks was like, uh, so is, I, I don't know offhand right now. In the old class, one of the homework assignments was like, Oh, show that you can do division with other basic relational algebra operators, and like it was a waste of time. You don't need it. Yeah. Other questions? All right. So this is now going to segue into uh, what we'll talk about next class. But the 
again, the relational algebra is still the high level steps of, of what, how we want the data system to compute our query, right? The order of these operators actually matter. And if you're actually building a system that would implement this, you would, you would sort of follow from the inside of the parentheses and, and work your way out, right? But the performance uh, can make a huge difference uh, depending on how you do some of these operators. So you want to be able to reorder them. So in my example here, say I'm doing uh, a join of RNS, and I can either do join first, followed by the projection, or sorry, the filter, so to only match the tuples with PID equals one or two, or I can do the, uh, the, the, the filter on, B, on S with PID equals one or two, then do the join, right? This could have pretty big performance differences, right? Like always think in extremes. If I have a billion tuples in R and a billion tuples in S, but only one tuple where BID equals one or two, do I want to do the one billion to one billion join or or scan the table or, or do a lookup, find the one tuple that does that where one or two equals or BID equals one or two, then do the join. Right? Relational algebra really doesn't give you that flexibility uh, as you know if you implement exactly as it's defined. So in a database system today, they're going to be allowed to reorder these different operators to produce the most efficient or the most uh, compet computationally efficient uh, execution strategy for your different queries, right? And these these operators are proposable where these are two, these are equivalent, but the order uh, can make a big difference. So yes, question. If you were to write SQL for this, would you still do like a select first? and then the join, or would you leave it up to a database? So this question is, if you were writing this in SQL, would you still want to specify to do the join first, followed by the filter? Uh, you can't. I was saying, I was not saying you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. Uh, in SQL, the, uh, there is a way with nested queries you can do exactly as you're proposing. Uh, a, a data system has a good optimizer could recognize, oh, I know what you're trying to do, and reorder it to rewrite it to put it back the way it should be. So you prefer to like have the database like optimizer would. Always, yes. Yeah. So in ninety nine percent of the cases, uh, you want the data system to reorder things for you. Now there are cases where it gets things get wrong, uh, and I, I can talk about those. It depends on the sophistication of the query optimizer. Depends on the last time you collected statistics, it depends what your data looks like. There's so many different caveats. Um, but in general, you want to just write the SQL at the way that you as the human think is the right way to write it, see what the query optimizer does with it, and then you can go back and tweak it if, if, if necessary later on. And a way to tweak it could be rewriting the SQL itself. Some systems allow you to provide hints and say, hey, you're, you're doing this, these operators in the wrong order, do it in this order. Or like, you're doing a scan, pick this index instead. There's a bunch of ways to, to force the data system to do the right thing for you. That's not a SQL standard. Every data system does, does something different. Postgres famously doesn't support hints, although there's exceptions to do this. In SQL Server, you can dump out the query plan as an XML, change it in hand, and load it back in. There's, there's all sorts of things you can do. Yes? I thought since SQL is like a non-decorative language, it's really up to the database management system to figure out how to treat it. So you, you said SQL is a non-declarative? It is declared. Yeah, so declared means no, no. it's not procedural. It's declared means this is the answer I want. Figure out how to do it. Right? So then his statement was like his question was, could you write SQL in a certain way that uh, you could specify the different orders? And my answer is yes, but the data system has a good query optimizer, which will explain what query optimizer is throughout the semester. Um, the query optimizer can look at that and say, Oh, I know what you're really trying to do, and you're, and you're doing it the wrong way. Here's a better way to run the query you want to run. In theory, you should always be able to do that. In practice, not always, because it's hard. Yes? Which comes out first, relational algebra or SQL? This question is, what comes out first, relational algebra or SQL? Relational algebra was defined in 1969 by Codd, uh, but he's a mathematician. He doesn't actually propose, but the answer is relational algebra. But he, never, he did not propose a programming language for his original paper. Uh, in, um, in 1972, COD then came out with his own programming language called Alpha. No one ever used it. Uh, IBM built a query language based on relational model called Square. No one could use that because you couldn't type it. Like, it was like still kind of math. You couldn't type. You had to type it vertically. 
No one types like that. Um, and then they came up with SQL. And then the the um, the guy that also the professor at Berkeley, uh, Mike Strobaker, who's also my PhD advisor, the guy that been Postgres and a bunch of things, um, he came up with his own language called Quell that basically taught kind of define here's the programming language. Everyone came up with their own. And then uh, the IBM guys, after they threw away Square, they came up with SQL, which is supposed to be a play on words of, of Quell. So it's the SQL to SQL to Square, or SQL to Quell, right? But then IBM got sued because because somebody else had the user name SQL, and that's why I got renamed to SQL. Yes. Okay, we'll, we'll cover it to the next slide. Sorry, I get very excited. So to slow me, somebody slow down because uh, there's a lot of things I want to discuss. Okay. Um, so again, we still want to be able to say in a high level way how we want the to compute this, right? This is what a declarative query language would look like, right? Hey, retrieving the retrieving the, the relation words if I join it to with RNS where BID equals one or two, right? That's written in English in natural language, but we can define this in SQL, and the data that could interpret this to figure out what's the best way to execute this. All right. So this will be the segue for what comes to the next class. Get the Relational model is independent of any actual query language implementation. But for all intents and purposes, SQL is the de facto standard. Uh, every five years, every so often, somebody shows up in Hacker News and says, I have a better version of SQL, and it never works, it never fails, right? Uh, SQL was here before you were born, and SQL will be here when you die, okay? <laughs> now, even though IBM invented it in the 1970s, it's not a dead language, right? There's, there's new versions, it gets extended all the time. So as new ideas come along, uh, like JSON can come along, and now you can do JSON and SQL. That's the SQL standard. So it's adapted and evolved over time, and it looks a lot different than it did back, back in the 1970s. Um, now, the challenge is going to be, you say you know SQL, but like there's the SQL standard, but nobody follows it. Right? I said MySQL is a big offender, but every single database system has their own you know, proprietary extensions that deviate from the SQL standard. Then they sit on the standards body, and they go say, hey, I have this new function that my system has. Let's get some in the SQL standard. And then Oracle says, yeah, they got something different. It looks slightly different. So then they bicker over, like, what should the actual language say? And then they end up with something in the standard that nobody actually ends up using, right? So basic select, insert, update, sleep, deletes, and selects, all that's in the standard. But it's when you start doing the more sophisticated things or more complex things, that's what nobody follows it. Uh, again, it's my opinion, uh, Postgres and Oracle probably are the best to, uh, the ones that follow the standard the most. All right, so. Again, just using our example at the very beginning, instead of writing this procedural language like this, we just say, hey, select star from artists where name equals JSON. And the JSON will figure out how to actually to go figure out the best way to run this query. Right? Because you know, somebody brought up before, if it's in a giant file and I have to do a linear scan, right, that's gonna suck if I have a billion records. So I can go to index. We'll talk about what indexes are in two more classes, but you know, nowhere in my, in my query did I say go go use this index to find my thing that I want in in log n time, right? It, you know, I don't have to know about indexes in, in my query language. The database system will, the database system will figure that out for me. Question? Yes. Wait. So, uh, so basically, the second the, all the database will execute that in log n time. So the question is, will a, a modern database system execute this in log n if you have a b plus three index, right? But like. This, this, the SQL doesn't know anything about indexes, right? I said, this, this is the answer that I want, and the data system can decide, do I want to use an index or not? And you could have a hash table index, right? And that could be 01, essentially, right? I don't, but, but if, I, if I, I can write this query in my application, I have two records at the very beginning, so I don't need an index. But if now I go up to a billion records, and then I go now create that index to speed up this query, I don't have to go change my application code, right? Because because they're independent from each other. That's that, that's the genius idea. It seems obvious now, but back then that was a big deal. Okay, so I think we have like ten minutes quickly, and I just want to show you. Uh, I see the class ends when four minutes. Four minutes. All right, let's bang quickly through just talk about the Docker data model, uh, just so you guys see this once. Uh, we're not really going to cover too much the rest of the semester, so. The Docker data model, sometimes called the object model, uh, XML databases, JSON databases, all of these are the same thing, right? And these are the bunch of sort of the, the leading ones. Mongo is probably the most famous one of all of these, uh, but it's not the first. Object databases go back to like the 1980s. 
All right, so basically the idea here is that instead of having separate relations, the, the way we have this relational model, they're going to try to mash things together and embed objects or embed data within each other, right? So before, if I had this, the, the three tables or three relations, artist, artist, album, and album, if I want to say, find me all, find me all the albums that this, this artist is on, I got to do a three-way join between uh, these tables, right? So the Docker data model guys say, oh, that sucks, that's slow. That's not how you write your application code. What you really want to do is just define your application code based on objects, like an object or in programming. And then I'm going to store the data for a single record in a giant JSON file, or YAML, or XML. Okay, they're all they're all equipped, right? And so what you're basically doing is you're embedding the the the, the two relations. You're sort of embedding the 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 dependent relation of the album is the child of artist. Uh, you're embedding that side side of this. So now if I say go give me all Jizza's albums, I go do a lookup to find the record where name equals Jizza, and as part of the, the, the payload I get back in my JSON document, I'm gonna have all my albums. Right? So now the new joins, I just, I just go one fetch to go find what I need. Is this a good idea or a bad idea, given what we talked about today? Yes. What if you want to go from albums to artists? He says, what if you want to go to albums to artists? Absolutely, yes. How would you do that? Dump it out, dump it back in. Yes. Do uh, that uh, database system that uses this model uh, just abstract the thing and then it would do the query back in an efficient way? Or This question is, do, do document databases abstract this away so you could just do the right thing? Uh, not really. Uh, like. Like MongoDB is, is if you ever use MongoDB, the first five minutes is beautiful. Like you, you open up the terminal, you start sticking JSON in, and it stores it. Fantastic, right? But like it doesn't enforce schema, it doesn't enforce types. You can put whatever you want in it, right? Uh, so I mean the application code could abstract it, but yet the data system doesn't. So yeah, from, from a relational models perspective, this is a bad idea. Right, because as he sort of said, like, what if I want to actually want to store, forget an album, what are all the artists I want to store in? Right? Or we talked about how an album could have multiple artists. That means now for Jizza, for everybody else that's on his albums, I got to have repeated records uh, with, with duplicated data. But then now, let's say there's a typo when I put it in the album and I got to go change the album's name. Now I got to make sure that for every single artist that's on that album, I have to go update the, update the record. Right? So I don't want to put this entirely. Uh, in, in my perspective, uh, the relational model is the right way, almost always the right way to, to model your database. Um, there are some cases where you do want to sort JSON because uh, it's, just, it's just easier. You can get up and running pretty, pretty quickly. But again, you can do that in the context of a relational database. You could have an attribute type be a JSON field. Postgres, MySQL, and most of them will, will do this for you. OK? All right, so we're over time. Database are ubiquitous. This class is important. Relational model is the building blocks for what we'll talk about the rest of the semester. Uh, and then next class will be about SQL. Okay? All right, guys. Hit it. Done and get it over with Cause the whole world's waiting for another Tears down street sound Clown a motherfucker if you label me a fake I'm like a cobra and I'm down with the super snake